Hello, everyone. Welcome to Clean Space Robotic Active Debris Removal um, Demo from Surrey Space Center at University of Surrey. My name is Yang Gao. I'm Professor of Space Autonomous Systems, uh, heading the Star Lab. And uh, here are my team. Hi everyone, my name is Nikos Mavrakis and I'm a research fellow at Starlab uh, working on robotic grasping for orbital applications. Hi, my name is Richard and I'm the technical officer for Fairspace. Hi, my name is Alexander Mososki, I'm a technician, I help uh, researchers to run experiments. Hello, my name is Daniel Johal. I'm a research fellow working at Starlab uh, on Fairspace project. Uh, my job is how to drive spacecraft smartly. Okay, here you go, yeah. So I'm going to give a very quick introduction about the background of the demo. So as, as people know, at the moment, our planet Earth is surrounded, orbited by a lot of space uh, uh, junk, or we call space debris. Uh, they could range from the spam motor uh, with nozzles, like the model I'm holding right now, or retired satellites, uh, like such as this kind of CubeSat, um, system and they're really harmful to the existing uh, space assets uh, such as satellites that is providing satellite navigation uh, or satellite TV so it's important and critical for us to develop robotic artificial intelligence solutions to help uh, autonomously run when dark and um, capture remove this kind of type of object in orbit so in this demo today, we're going to use uh, the target, which is like the model I'm holding right now, because it's relatively more challenging for robotic grippers to capture because of the curvy surface. And also you're going to see different rounds of uh, trials so that you can see how the decision-making systems on board the robot could decide in real time whether it's safe or not safe to proceed. And this is very important to secure the safety of our spacecraft uh, equipped with the robotic arms. And I would also like to take the opportunity to thank our Fair Space uh, program, uh, which funded the research uh, behind this demo, as well as UK RAS Network, uh, who created the opportunity for us to engage with you guys today online live. Hope you enjoyed the demo. See you. See you. Okay, it's Daniel here. I'm I'm taking over as a producer and along with my colleagues, Nikos. Nikos, do you want to say hi again? Hello, everyone. Hi again. Okay, so Nikos, um, what we're going to show to people today, can you give us another recap, a very quick one? Well, uh, yes, as uh, Yang mentioned, today we're going to show a demo execution of a robotic satellite attempting to capture a piece of space debris, which basically is an Apogee kick motor. And uh, an Apogee kick motor is basically the uh, top part of a rocket, and uh, its purpose is to place the, the satellite, the payload, as we say, in its final orbit. And uh, they have not been designed to the orbit naturally so they have uh, we have to develop some uh, very novel methods to actually attempt to capture them and uh, deorbit them uh, some of these uh, targets can stay in orbit for up to 25 or more years as uh, some of them are uh, they are still um, in orbit ever since the 60s so um, this demo today is about uh, again as i said uh, attempting to capture uh, such a satellite and uh, you will see pretty much uh, what we are attempting to do in a simulation now. So Daniel, uh, do you mind uh, playing the simulation? Thank you. Uh, as you can see, the, the shiny part is the Apogee kick motor, so the top part of the rocket. And uh, the yellow part uh, of the simulation is the chasing satellite, which is equipped with uh, a robotic arm and a gripper. The task that the robot needs to do is to get close to the piece of space debris, so the Apogee kick motor, and find out a good uh, capturing point um, in order to execute the capture. As soon as it executes the capture, it needs to pull the target back for a 
specified distance, as you can see on the demo. And uh, the, one of the technologies we have been developing in Starlab is actually the, uh, the, uh, the autonomous method of uh, finding out a good uh, grasping point. Um, so now how the robot, how does the robot know how, where exactly to capture the satellite? It uh, can capture the satellite by calculating a point cloud of uh, the object, as we say, of the target. A point cloud is uh, basically a pattern, a light pattern, that uh, the uh, sensor shoots to the target, and then it measures the distortion of this pattern. This distortion is translated to distance from the sensor, and then it's translated to a point. So each point of the point cloud represents the distance of each part of the target from the camera. And we use this point cloud to extract the grasping point from the target. Uh, you can see an execution of the uh, algorithm here. So Daniel will show you a video of uh, the execution. This is exactly uh, the execution as you can see. So this is me going around a mock-up of the nozzle with uh, the sensor. And you can see on the top left part, uh, the grasping points, which are represented with these uh, coordinate frames, as you can see, uh, are, uh, they are being generated for the point cloud uh, almost instantaneously. I think we have uh, uh, about 0 0.25 seconds for uh, 25 or something um, grasping points. And uh, as you can see, the algorithm, as I said, is uh, very fast and uh, quite reliable. So you can see the speed of the calculation of the uh, grasping points. And uh, the robot then uh, picks one of these grasping points as the most uh, suitable grasping point to capture the piece of space debris. So uh, to bring all this technology back to Earth, because we it's not very easy to test it in a, in a real space, a yeah, uh, we need to have a test bed that mimics uh, exactly the or to the extent of possible, the orbital environment. And you can see the test bed in your screens now. So Daniel, would you mind telling us what the test bed includes? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Nikos, for the introductions. As you can see from the picture on the, on the left hand side, that's a live streaming video and showing our test bed over here. We call it ro orbital robotic test bed. So what does, what does it do? It actually simulates this simulation uh, with the hardware in the loop. So the traverser, which on the left hand side, you can see the track system is simulating the servicing spacecraft as a yellow cube showing on the simulation. And we have a UR5 arm sitting on top of the traverser. You cannot see now, but you will see it in the demo because uh, the field of review uh, of the camera. And on the right hand side, as you can see here, we have the target, which is the nozzle holding by another UR5 arm which used the sixth of freedom, uh, degree of freedom to simulate a microgravity simulation uh, in space, which means if we move the nozzle around, uh, if we touch it, it will uh, f float or move as in a microgravity environment. We do have a video to show people, right, Nikos? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's what we do the testing, as you can see here. Nikos, do you want to give a bit more recap on this? Yes, exactly. So this is me having some fun with the nozzle here. And uh, what is happening is that uh, the target arm, this arm that you can see there, is equipped with a force sensor. So it is able to actually sense the amount of force I'm putting on the object. And then it um, drives this force through a simulator that simulates the motion of the target as if it was in space. So then this motion is fed back into the robot and it's precisely followed by the target arm. So we can then mimic a weightless environment for uh, our target. Uh, this system is quite responsive and uh, you can see that it will perform well. Okay, now I guess uh, enough of talk. Let's go to the exciting parts to show the live demo. Okay, so as you may know, um, remove a debriting space is not just capturing it, but also as well as rendezvous and, uh, you know, it, Imagine if you have a target at far distance, you need to approach it. So the first part of testbed is the traverser, which is simulated service spacecraft. So we're moving into a state which we can have a better measure of the point cloud for the target. So as you can see now, the spacecraft start moving, approaching to the target. You can see now the traverser uh, and the wizard arm is slowly approaching the target to get to the stage one. 
And also you can see from a, a second screen I'm sharing here, uh, you can see that's the live streaming of the point cloud um, from the camera. Nikos, do you want to give a bit more introduction on this part? Yes, exactly. As I mentioned before, the sensor ha shoots a, 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 light, a light pattern to the target, and you can see this light pattern, the result actually of this light pattern on the top screen, on the top left screen. And uh, the bottom left screen is actually um, a camera, uh, a, the camera feed of the sensor. It also has an RGBD camera, so the, sat the chasing satellite can exactly uh, see what is going on with respect to the target. And uh, to the right, you can see the point cloud, the generated point cloud, as I mentioned before. You can see that uh, there is also the wall in the back of our uh, test bed, but this is not uh, calculated, uh, taken into account for the calculation of the grasping point. So, Nikos, let's move to the uh, pre-capturing state. Is that all right? Yes, definitely. Yeah, sure. So, as we have more information about the target, now we are safe to approaching to the pre-capturing phase, which means we will be closer to the target. And at the same time, we can get a better image of the point cloud as well. As you can see, the point cloud is to keep updating as well. So now we are ready for capturing, right, Nikos? Yes, definitely. Before we execute the capturing, we need to discuss exactly what uh, the potential outcome will be. So uh, the, the chasing robot will attempt to capture the surface of the nozzle to a calculated point that it will calculate. And it will attempt to pull it back uh, for a specified distance. We're not sure whether exactly it will succeed or fail in actually retaining the object for the whole duration of the pool. And this is something very exciting that uh, happens every time. So there is yeah. a chance that uh, the robot actually captures the object and uh, maybe does not capture the object. So let's execute the demo. So let's see. And see. So now Nikos is running the, the, the program now. As you can see now, the arms start approaching to the target and find the grasping point and do the gripping and start doing the pulling motion, I assume, Nikos. Yes, exactly. You can see that. Oh, oh Nikos. The robot, the robot actually did not succeed this time. So it lost contact with the target and it will now return to its original position. That's okay. It happens. It's natural for. Uh, uh, these type of things to happen because actually attempting to um, capture pieces of space debris, it's uh, extremely challenging. There is a lot of reasons that it can be very challenging. You can see the robot going on to uh, the approaching point, then attempting to reach the grasping point, closing the gripper, and let's see the moment of truth is here. As you can see, there is a sort oh, okay. So the robot in this time did not actually succeed to capture the object because as you can see, the object uh, slid from uh, the fingers. That's okay, we can try again. Yeah, actually um, attempting to capture satellites and uh, space debris is uh, very difficult uh, because of a number of reasons, basically. The number one reason is uh, the friction coefficient between the uh, fingers, the robotic fingers, and the target. Especially in space, this friction tends uh, to be increased, and it's very difficult for the robot to retain its grasp after it has captured the, the target. Uh, another, um, uh, another reason for failure is that uh, the robot, so the robotic gripper, fails to apply a continuous force, a very strong force for capturing the target all the time. The relative position between the target and uh, the, the chasing arm uh, makes for this uh, force to not be applied continuously. So the robot, let's say, relaxes its uh, grasp with respect to the, uh, to the target. Uh, we need to, in some cases, we need to develop some uh, more elaborate uh, control methods that uh, enable the chasing arm to touch the target in a more soft way, let's say, so that it minimizes the, the possibility of uh, failure. Okay, Nikos, can you run the algorithms now? Yes, sure. So you can see the robot actually finding a different grasping point and attempting to capture the, the target. And we have a capture. 
and there is a pool. Oh, this time, okay, I think this time the robot made it. Oh, yeah. So that's good. Yeah. It was a it was a good call this time. So I think uh, the robot was able to hold the target for the whole duration of the pool. And um, this is very exciting because uh, it's more often that we fail to capture something in space of because course. it's very challenging rather than we uh, succeed in capturing something. And, uh, and uh, when it does, uh, it can gives us quite a good uh, estimate of how to design this type of controllers and this type of um, AI methods for grasping and for actually successful uh, debris removal. You can see that the robot has found a successful grasping point and it moves to that. So now it will attempt to capture the target and let's see whether we'll have a successful grasp. That looks okay. That's okay. Almost. Okay, we can see again another point. Okay, let me show it. Let's see. Okay. okay, yeah, we have now the view of our okay. test bed. Oh, oh was it was successful? Wow, Nikos, I think... That was another was... successful grasp, which is very good. Uh, I think I'm quite surprised because uh, this was two out of three, right? Wow, that's very that's good. So good. Typically, we get like one out of five or whatever. <laughs> uh, I mean... Uh, it doesn't uh, happen that uh, often that we have uh, that many success. As, as mentioned before, with the test bed, we are trying to simulate, we're using the light absorbing materials, trying to simulate the space lighting conditions. So another problem for doing this sort of like job in space with, compu com with computer vision is the extreme lighting environment. Is that right, Nikos? Yes, exactly. So, for example, the infrared lights can fully affect the point in clouds, the quality of point in clouds. So, you, sometimes you need to, to use some specially qualified uh, sensors, have some perfilting ring, and some algorithm to compensate those things as well. Exactly. So, it's uh, very typical that the point cloud is uh, quite messy with a lot of noise and a lot of holes or missing parts. And it's uh, natural for an algorithm to try to work around these issues by working uh, with the point cloud that it has, or even employing other modules of uh, other modes of sensing, such as RGB cameras and uh, perhaps lidar sensors, which are another uh, sort of laser sensors that are rotating and calculating distances, and uh, so on and so forth. It's as we said, it's a very challenging problem. It, it is. That's that's uh, that's very interesting research areas. So uh, I saw we have uh, uh, qu quite a few audience here. Is there any question for us? So we have a question come through from the audience. Uh, his name is Patrick uh, Hothos, and he's asking, that looks very cool. Would you also be able to simulate the movement of the debris in the approaching phase and uh, immediately before grasping? Um, that would be interesting to do. So if I understand the question, so simulate the movement of the debris in the approaching phases. Uh, what we're doing is um, for this particular demo, we are considering that uh, the target is um, um, the target and the chaser, they are synchronized and they have matched their uh, relative velocities. Uh, if we consider the target as a, spe as, a, as a single entity, then it tumbles in space. But the chasing satellite needs to have um, matched the rotation, uh, the rotation of uh, its body to the rotation of the target. Let's say, uh, in some cases, it is possible to do so. We have some uh, uh, other types of research that are looking into pose estimation and the motion estimation of um, tumbling uh, tumbling targets. But uh, for the purpose of this demo, we consider that uh, the Chaser uh, satellite and the target have matched their uh, relative velocities. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, Nikos. Uh, yeah, we have follow-up comments. Do you want to? Um, yes, definitely. Say a few words about this? Uh, it's actually um, in the rendezvous phase. The spacecraft is actually responsible for uh, making this type of calculations, so estimating a lot of properties 
of the target, let's say uh, the mass of the target, the position of the target, the relative pose with respect to the chasing spacecraft, and uh, the rotational velocity of uh, the spacecraft. And um, in the proximity phase, which is typically in the range of a couple of meters, so basically... It's quite risky if we do all the things, you know, well, the grasping. Yes, exactly. Still synchronize the motion. Uh, the, the job that the robot needs to do in the proximity phase, which is basically a couple of meters to a couple of centimeters away from the target, is to identify a good grasping point, having identified all the initial properties of the target in the rendezvous phase. The rendezvous phase can be up to a couple of kilometers away from the target. Uh, it's a very good question, because... Yeah, exactly. And space debris can be found in uh, many different shapes and sizes. So basically, these types of um, debris that we are uh, dealing with uh, are categorized as uh, over 10 centimeters. And they can uh, be ranging from um, a couple of, uh, uh, let's say, centimeters, uh, tens of centimeters, to a couple of meters, sometimes more than uh, five or six meters. And uh, there is also the problem of uh, debris that are um, uh, smaller than uh, this scale. And uh, the numbers of space debris are uh, astonishing. So let's say for this particular case that we are investigating now, almost 18% uh, of all um, pieces, let's say, of space debris uh, are this type of uh, rocket stages. So you can see that uh, it's, it's very crowded up there. We need to do something and we need to produce some very good research on... Uh, how to actually clean the environment in orbit. Oh, we, we have a question came through, Nico, so maybe we can use 10 minutes, uh, sorry, 10 seconds to answer it. And so what are you doing with the debris after the capturing them? Uh, that's a very good question. There is a, a post-capture phase that uh, we can uh, uh, simulate or emulate. Unfortunately, we don't do it in uh, this type of um, experiments with a testbed. And it's called the rigidization phase. Uh, what happens after that is that uh, the target, the chasing arm needs to, uh, let's say, make itself very rigid and apply a very strong connection with the target so that it uh, can ensure, um, uh, uh, let's say, the successful deorbit and successful uh, future tasks with uh, the target. Basically, in this, in this uh, rigidization phase, the target and uh, the satellite uh, have, um, are matching their uh, velocities and their, um, angular, their angular momentums. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. But also, uh, if you ask the question about further, what we're going to do, you can do servicing, you can do refueling. And for the nozzle, what are you going to do? You have to deorbit it or you know, capture it and recycle the, the, the materials. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, OK, um, I, th I think, Nico, so there was, for the last round, there was a question was asking, uh, are the grip size uh, affect the, the effectiveness of the gripping algorithm as well, right? Yes, uh, actually there was a question like that, and I think it's uh, worth mentioning. And um, uh, this robot right now has some fingertips uh, of a rounded shape. And uh, our research in Starlab has shown that it's uh, more beneficial to capture something uh, of uh, this conical shape with rounded fingers instead of planar fingers. This happens because um, the round, uh, let's say, the round shape, the rounded shape of uh, the fingertips tends to match the surface of um, the nozzle. So it uh, yields a, a grasp that has more chances of success. Uh, we are testing with uh, different uh, sizes of fingertips to see whether the radius of the fingertip is actually uh, affecting the uh, chances of uh, successful capture. And uh, another potential uh, good application would be to test uh, with uh, uh, different materials of fingertips. Because right now, for we have only 3D printed fingertips. We can um, try to capture the object uh, with uh, rubber fingertips, silicon fingertips, uh, metallic fingertips, anything. So we can see how different friction um, affects uh, the chances of uh, successful capture. OK. Uh, Nikos, uh, there is a question. Are these technology transferable to other sectors? Can you answer it? Yes, definitely. So um, these type of technologies uh, are definitely transferable to other sectors because uh, at their core, uh, they employ point clouds, which are widely used in most sectors from agriculture to 
indoor robotics to extreme environments to industry, anything you can imagine. And uh, the result of the grasping algorithm basically uh, are just uh, raw grasps. So these raw grasps can be applied to any type of scenario. There is nothing inherently spacey, let's say, about the grasping procedure. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's very typical to have this type of processing to other uh, domains as well. Uh, the deep learning for pause estimation can also be applied to other uh, types of other industries. Uh, however, it has been uh, developed uh, with the lighting conditions and the targets that uh, are met in a weightless environment in orbit. Uh, so it has, let's say, a higher uh, difficulty of uh, being transferred, but it's uh, definitely possible. So there was, of course, a question about wouldn't debris eventually fall down to Earth? Yeah, uh, I can answer that question. I think, yeah, that's a question for uh, Daniel, who is our space expert here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, overcompromised. Uh, anyway, OK, cool. So depends the orbit. So it depends how far the, the debris is from the Earth. You know, it depends if they are designed to be the orbitable or not. For example, if there's a really large structure at very high the altitude, it can take up about a few years or even 20, 40 years to do the orbit. So that won't be eventually fall down to the Earth. You need to have some method, the orbiting method. For example, you can have a workable thruster to push the orbit, uh, to push the objects back to the very close to orbit to the deorbiting altitude. Or you can have a sender robot to grasp it, like what we're doing here. Um, because loads of early stage space uh, objects or space mission, they not really consider uh, the orbiting. They're not really expecting, you know, uh, our orbits getting so congested these days. So that's why um, for the big agency like ESA are pushing forward a clean space uh, agenda just trying to be more responsible, you know, when you're launching a spacecraft, we're launching orbit, uh, objecting to orbit, you have to consider uh, how you recycle them. So that's that's a, one of the things we need to consider. Um, there are some of the design these days, they fly really low, like uh, maybe, uh, maybe 300 kilometers or even lower. So they will be eventually uh, naturally falling down to the Earth. Uh, maybe within a very short lifetime because they are designed so. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm pretty sure you've all have seen the very recent footage of the Canada arm that was pierced um, from end to end by uh, such a type of uh, debris. And uh, it's very difficult because um, even though they tend to naturally deorbit uh, quite fast, let's say, it's very difficult to actually track them, identify them, and capture them, and then get rid of them in some meaningful way. Uh, I would say that uh, from the largest pieces of space debris, uh, the most dangerous one are these types of uh, spent rocket stages, and especially some of them that tend to be in the range of a couple of meters, let's say, big. Um, because uh, sometimes they may have a propellant left over, and uh, sometimes uh, they have a residue in the pro propellant in the nozzle, which tends to create extra uh, debris. It's actually a very challenging problem. And uh, as you can see, uh, there is a lot of the ways that we can approach it. I hope this answers the question. All right. So how do extreme conditions, for example, make the world? Oh, yeah. that's a good question for Nikos. That's challenging. Uh, that's indeed a very nice question because uh, there is a lot of uh, reasons that uh, this grasping task is uh, very challenging and uh, some of them have been identified as well in the question. So let's say the radiation and um, the difference in the lighting conditions tend to create uh, some holes and some uh, noise, let's say, in missing parts on the point cloud. Especially with this type of sensor that we use right now in our testbed, as it is, it would not work in an orbital environment because it has not been designed uh, for that. The structured light that it emits is uh, scattered uh, very easily in these type of conditions. Uh, in space, to extract the point cloud, uh, other missions and uh, uh, other experiments use uh, either a stereo camera, which is basically two cameras that identify features on the RGB image and uh, then translate these features into depth information. 
Uh, or uh, there is uh, some um, uh, proposals to use a LiDAR sensor, which is basically another type of laser sensor that is more focused and uh, tends to have, um, uh, let's say, more uh, less chances of uh, having a scatter. But um, with respect to the microgravity part, um, the difficulty is in the control bit right now and uh, in the contact phase. So when we have a contact, with uh, the gripper. If it is on Earth, then we can uh, take uh, gravity into advantage and uh, implement some grasping algorithms that uh, uh, match this uh, pool of the gravity. Uh, in orbit, it's very difficult because we need to approach the target in a very soft manner, in a very soft touch. If we approach it very hard, then there is a chance that not only we deorbit, not deorbit, let's say push away the target, but we also push away the satellite itself as well, so our body, uh, due to the uh, reactive uh, forces that are being induced. Just to appreciate everybody's participation this afternoon, uh, thank you so very much. And thanks all the team members who put really hard work into this. Hope you enjoyed it. Stay in touch with us. <laughs> okay, thank bye. Thank you. Bye.